Please hurry, a woman shouted into the phone, calling the ambulance. My son has stopped breathing. He's so little. Please hurry. Help. Please help him. I beg you. Please give me the address, said the dispatcher on the other end of the line. Please stop crying and tell me your name, your child's name, and where you live. The faster you calm down and give me your address, the faster the ambulance will come to you. Tobias, his name is Tobias, said the distraught mother, giving the address, but continuing to sob and beg for the ambulance to come quickly. The dispatcher quickly passed on the information to the ambulance. The child is not breathing, shouted Neville to the driver, and they rushed to the specified address. Five minutes later, the ambulance stopped and the driver opened the door. We've arrived, this is the entrance, he waved at the grey steel door. Neville and Charles hurried inside without hesitation. Fortunately, an old woman came out of the entrance and held the door for them, telling them which floor they needed. Neville pressed the doorbell and the door immediately opened. Where is your son? Neville asked, entering the hallway. Charles followed close behind. There, in the nursery, the woman waved her hand at the door and fell into a chair, crying and hiding her face in her hands. The baby lay on the couch, covered with a blanket almost to his head. Only wet strands of dark hair were visible on the clean, light green pillow. Tobias? Charles called softly and touched the child, but then pulled his hand back and almost screamed. At first, he thought they had come too late. The baby wasn't moving and was frozen. But when Neville pulled the blanket off him, both doctors almost turned grey, realising that they were looking at an ordinary doll, a life-size boy. He looked like he could be two years old, no more. It was made very realistically, and it was quite possible that it was a custom order. Talented handmade work, Neville said, examining the toy child's rosy chubby cheeks. From the adjacent room came the sobs of a woman who called herself a mother. What should we do? asked Charles. First we need to inform that the call, thank God, is false. At least that's good, answered Neville. Okay, then you call them while I'll go see the inconsolable mother. Charles, be careful there. You never know what's on her mind, warned Neville. Oh, Neville, come on, she's so young. Twenty-five years old at most, or thereabouts, replied Charles, and went out to the crying woman. Meanwhile, the grieving mother got up from her chair and rushed to him. How's my baby? Is he alive? Calm down. He's not in danger. Let me take your details and we'll pass them on to our colleagues. They work more in this area and will provide you with timely and necessary assistance. What's your name? From what he said, the woman only heard that Tobias was not in danger and his question about her name. My name is Madeline and my son Tobias. He's a good boy, quiet, calm, obedient, and I was so scared when I realized he wasn't breathing. Everything will be fine promised Charles, and the woman went to where Neville was. She hugged the doll and suddenly looked at Neville in surprise, then turned her gaze to Tobias. My son is a doll? she asked incredulously. Where is my son? Where did you take him? There was a doll on the bed, not a boy. Where did you buy it? asked Neville. Where did I buy? She repeated the question and her face suddenly distorted with a grimace of pain. Yes, I bought him. I forgot. I thought he looked like my missing son. The woman covered her face with her hands and burst into bitter tears. Okay, said Neville. Now you are speaking about your missing son. Okay, we understand, Madeline. You need to come with us. We'll help you. Where's your passport? Madeline obediently complied with the doctors and did everything they asked. She no longer cried, and only tears quietly rolled down her cheeks. 
leaving two wet trails. Neville and Charles returned to the car. Listening to their conversation, the driver turned out on the yard and headed for the hospital. Realizing what had happened, he shook his head. Poor woman. She must have wanted a baby so badly. That's why she couldn't handle the suffering. But maybe she never had children, said Neville, sighing. I also doubt that someone stole her son, said Charles. Who would do that and why? She's not rich and can hardly pay a good ransom. She lives in a poor environment. In general, something's not right here. What difference does it make, said the driver. She wants children, not like some people. My daughter grew up when I didn't even notice. She's already married for the second time. I told her, when are you going to give me and your mother grandchildren? But she just waves it off. We, she says, want to live for ourselves. Rest, see the world, and maybe we're child-free. Have you heard of such a thing? The word itself is so disgusting. Child-free, ugh, it's even hard to say. People have gone crazy. They're tired, they want to relax, and it's not just my holly. There are many childless families now just because women don't want to give birth. Oh my God, where is the world going? And your patient is great. She's a real mother, or will be her. Under driver's grumbling, Neville and Charles arrived at the hospital, but they were immediately sent to a new call. Someone had an accident on the road. The duty was generally difficult, but the unhappy weeping woman, holding a doll close to her, could not get out of Neville's head. Charles was clearly upset. Listen, what do you think will happen to her? He asked his partner. With Madeline? Asked Neville, although he immediately understood who Charles was talking about. Well, as if you don't know, they'll take some tests, sedate her, check her brain for inflammations and tumours, refer her to a psychotherapist. And then... Either they'll release her or close her up for a long time. Listen, let's not talk about it. It's already very heavy on the soul. Okay, Charles nodded and fell silent too. But Neville unexpectedly interrupted the silence. We need to visit her. She's clearly a newcomer here, living without relatives. Maybe she needs something. What can we bring to her? We'll find out. Charles was somehow delighted. Let's go tomorrow and find out everything. But you know, I was distressed today when I went to see her so-called son. I've been working for the ambulance for almost 15 years. My sons are already grown up. But I can't get used to children's emergency calls. Every time, I worry like it's the first time. And my heart jumps out of my chest when I see a suffering child. I'm the same way. Neville nodded. I guess it's our speciality as doctors. Do you know Dr. Anthony Breen, the orthopedic surgeon from our hospital? Charles asked after a pause. I don't know him personally, but I know there's such a person. Yeah, him, Neville continued his story. We've been friends for a long time. So he's been working in the hospital for so many years, and then he calls me in the middle of the night asking me to come over because his son is sick. The boy was only two years old. Such a good boy. I was scared. I thought it was something serious, if Anthony couldn't handle it himself. But thank God, the boy just had a common cold. But Anthony got scared. He was standing there pale, and I said to him, Why are you so nervous? Haven't you seen a cold before? Or is it your first year of practice? And he replied, I don't know. As soon as I noticed that my boy was hot and wheezing, my legs gave out. He's just a child. He's so little. Wait, where's the child's mother? Charles asked. Well, it's a complicated story. His wife left him, went to the capital with some guy she met. You probably know her. Claudia, such a beautiful redhead, worked in the emergency department. Was she really his wife? Charles raised his eyebrows in surprise. Yes, Neville nodded. Charles thought for a moment. 
He remembered Claudia very well, especially since, like everyone else, he was fascinated by her provocative beauty. Actually, he wasn't just fascinated. Once they were on duty together, and Claudia, who always accepted male attention with a benevolent smile, easily gave in to Charles. He didn't know what came over him. Some kind of madness. They went to an empty utility room, but they never did it, as someone called Claudia and she had to leave. Later, she and Charles saw each other more than once, but they didn't try to get closer to each other again. They just smiled at each other in a special way, and then she quit. Charles didn't ask what had happened to her. He was already having an affair with his current wife, Hope, and flirting with Claudia had remained in the past forever. And if Neville hadn't reminded him of now, Charles would hardly have thought of Claudia himself. He remained silent for a little longer, then suddenly stirred. Wait, did you say Anthony and Claudia have a son? But how could she abandon him? She didn't abandon the child, Neville explained, shrugging. It's not hers. They didn't have any children. I'm telling you, it's a murky story. After the divorce, Anthony was upset for a long time and even started drinking. He was fired from the hospital for being absent. During that time, he met a girl who worked at a liquor store. She was from some closed settlement or something like this. I don't know exactly where she's from. At first, she sold alcohol to him, but when he started coming for bottles non-stop, she suddenly stopped. She started shaming him, telling him he was sinking to the bottom. At first he was angry, but then he started listening to her. Gradually, he got involved in a new relationship. She came to him, cleaned up the apartment, cooked, and of course it didn't go without intimacy. In short, this girl pulled Anthony out of his misery. And then her mother showed up. She saw who her daughter was living with, created a scandal and took her away. She took her back to her homestead, apparently. And what about Anthony? Charles asked. Nothing, Neville replied. He didn't know anything besides her name. I asked him how this could be. And he just shrugged and said, it was so good with her, better than anyone else. And everything else seemed unimportant. He even wanted to marry her. But this girl's mother ruined everything. In short, they disappeared. And a year later, someone left a basket with a child at Anthony's door. Can you imagine? He went to the police, but they just shrugged. They wanted to put the baby boy in an orphanage, but Anthony did a DNA test and found out that it was his son. Since then, he has been raising him himself. He moved out of his rented apartment and back to his mother's apartment. She helped him for the first years. Now he lives separately from her again and has his own place with a mortgage. And when he goes on duty, Anthony's mother stays with little Ethan. She comes to visit her grandson. Wow, that's a sad story. It's good that in the end Anthony was able to rise from the bottom and return to his practice. Okay, Neville, see you around. And don't forget about Madeline. Two weeks passed. One morning, Neville and Charles, who had once again been out on the same shift, saw a young woman waving modestly at them from a distance. She hurried to them. Hello, Madeline, Neville smiled. How are you feeling? I came to thank you for visiting me at the hospital and not leaving me in trouble, for the things that you collected for me, just for worrying. Honestly, I don't know such words of gratitude to express. You better tell us how you are, said Charles, who was embarrassed by such praise. Well, I'm fine now. The doctor said it was a one-time nervous breakdown. They didn't find anything wrong with me, although I had to spend a week in the hospital. Neville, Charles, don't think badly of me. I'm perfectly normal. And they really did steal my child. I came to this city to find him, and I will find him. And the nervous breakdown? You see, I was exhausted that day. I wandered around the city for a long time, and suddenly I saw a boy on the storefront. 
and it suddenly seemed to me that he might look like my little boy. I bought the doll and didn't take my eyes off her all evening. I cried, and then suddenly it seemed to me that he was alive and not breathing. I'm sorry that I caused a panic and even called an ambulance. Are you feeling better now? Yes, thanks to you. We're glad, Neville and Charles said in unison and laughed. And now, excuse us, Madeline, we need to work. Yes, yes, I'm also rushing to work. Only, guys, here, I brought you pies. This is ingratitude for what you did. Did you bake them yourself? Charles was somehow surprised. Yes, I work at the pie shop on the corner of 29th Street. It's my part-time job. I am a teacher by profession, and I came to work early today to have time to prepare the pies for you. The men thanked Madeline again, took the package with the pies, and said goodbye to her, happy that everything ended well for her. The day was coming to an end when Anthony called Neville. Hello, buddy. Listen, I have a problem. I've asked everyone, but no one can help me. And if you can't help, then it's unfortunate. What happened? You see, tomorrow I start my intensive course in the medical school. I have to go, but it's for three days and I have no one to look after Ethan. My mother got sick. It's nothing serious, just a common sore throat, but she can't take care of the child anymore. She's lying down with a fever and coughing hard. I called everyone but everyone had their own things to do. Ethan is a calm kid, not problematic. So I thought, can your wife take care of him? I will pay. Just tell me how much. What are you talking about? Neville protested. I wouldn't take any money from you. But the thing is, Mary and our daughter left yesterday to visit her parents. They've been gone for several days and won't be back until next week. Okay, I understand. Sorry for bothering you. Anthony's voice sounded not just disappointed, but truly hopeless. I tried to find a nanny through an ad, but they all seemed unreliable. Listen, Neville suddenly had an idea. I have a new acquaintance. Her name is Madeline. She's a good girl, really. She lives alone. Do you want me to talk to her and have her come over? You can see her for yourself. I think you'll like her. By the way, she's also a teacher by profession. Charles, who heard the entire conversation, widened his eyes and quickly whispered to Neville, You're out of your mind. She just got out of the mental hospital. Can she be trusted with a child? You're taking a risk. She is normal, Charles. I saw her eyes, and you did too. And the psychiatrist said that she's fine. Anyway, you should tell Anthony who she is, Charles said. Neville nodded. Anthony, there's one thing, though. Anthony listened carefully, paused, and then asked, Would you trust her with your child? Yes, Neville replied without hesitation. Okay, Anthony said. Send her over to me. Returning from another call, Neville asked the driver to turn onto 29th Street, which was not far from them. There's a pie shop there. Can you stop for a minute, please? The driver, a reserved 50-year-old man, wasn't used to asking unnecessary questions and fulfilled his request without any conversation, saying only, Oh, I know the place. Sometimes I buy donuts from them. Very delicious. They arrived at the location and the first person Neville saw was Madeline. She was surprised to see her acquaintance, but when she understood what he was asking for, she smiled simply and openly, of course, give me the address, and I'll come to your friend's place at seven. Neville left all of Anthony's information and left, while Madeline, as promised, went to the address that she had written on a notebook sheet. Soon she was standing in front of the door of the needed apartment, pressing the doorbell. The door was opened quickly, but as soon as Madeline saw the man standing before her, she paled sharply and fell unconscious into his arms. Anthony picked her up and carried her to the couch, repeating her name and trying to revive her. When she opened her eyes, he asked, surprised by the unexpected visit, How did you find me? She burst into tears in response and said, 
Anthony, Anthony, my mother didn't forgive me. She took me away. She wanted me to marry Damon, but I was already expecting our son. My mother screamed that I was a bad daughter, that I betrayed everyone. Everyone turned away from me. My relatives cursed me for disgracing them. They took me to a village where I gave birth to my boy, and I named him Tobias. Remember, you wanted to name our son that, and a week later, my baby was stolen from me. I know my mother did it. She didn't want such a grandchild, and I was supposed to marry some old man and serve him all my life. Oh my God, Madeline! Anthony couldn't find the words, but she continued hurriedly, gasping for breath as she told the story of her unhappy life. Anthony, I ran away at night. The old woman who was watching me was asleep. There was a real storm outside at night, and I quietly left. I hid for a long time, didn't want to be found, and I managed to come back here. Kind people helped me. I came to your old address, and I wanted to tell you everything. I wanted you to help me find our little son, but you weren't there. But Tobias is alive. I know it. I feel it. Anthony stood up and lifted Madeline, then led her to the room where little Ethan was sleeping. This is him! Madeline exclaimed, reaching out to the child. My Tobias. Ethan, Anthony corrected her. His name is Ethan. He was left at my door. This is our son. I have proof and documents. Madeline touched her son with gentle movements, but her hands shook, and tears streamed down her face. My little son, how long I've been looking for! Anthony hugged her and held her close. Stop crying, Madeline, my good girl. I won't let you go anywhere, and won't give you to anyone. Now everything will be fine with us. Let Ethan sleep a little longer, and we'll go to the kitchen. Have some tea and talk. We have so much more to tell each other. The next day, the happy, smiling Madeline left with Anthony and little Ethan. While Anthony worked, Madeline took care of their son, and then they walked around the city together, rested, and enjoyed the happiness that had so unexpectedly returned to them. Anthony didn't forget to call Neville to thank him for everything. And tell the amazing story of his love, Anthony. I'm so happy for you," Neville said. "Your Madeline immediately seemed to me an unusual woman, beautiful, kind, but very unhappy. Let everything be good for you. I sincerely wish you that. As soon as we return to the city, we'll immediately get married," Anthony promised, and. We will invite you and Charles to our wedding. Will you come? We will definitely come. Neville laughed and hurried to Charles to tell him the unexpected news. So kind and happy, and therefore very rare in our time. Happiness and love exist, and everyone needs to believe that it will eventually find everyone who deserves it.